Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the conference organizing committee, it is my honor to welcome you on the first international uh, conference, uh, church and religious association behind the Iron Curtain. Today we will be discussing about the first decade of the communist dictatorship in the Central and Eastern Europe and what it brought to the various churches in the various um, uh, countries. The conference will be opened by the presidents of the three institutions which organized this uh, event, Insti Institute of National Remembrance from Poland, uh, Committee of National Remembrance from Hungary, and National Memory Institute from Slovakia. I would like now um, to ask the vice president of the IPN, Professor Karol Polajowski, to speak first and open our conference. Uh, the floor is yours, Mr. President. Professor, thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very pleased uh, to welcome you on behalf of the President of the Institute of National Remembrance, Dr. Karol Nawrotsky, to the International Scientific Conference, Churches and Religious Associations Behind the Iron Curtain, Part 1, 1945-1956. We are organizing this conference with two peer scientific research institutions, the Slovak uh, UPN and the Hungarian NEB. This is the first in a series of planned events devoted to this topic. The next two will be held successively in Bratislava and Budapest. We are taking up an important issue that still needs to be researched so that we can present as fully as possible the significance of churches and religious associations behind the Iron Curtain. On September 6th and 7th, speakers from numerous Central and Eastern European countries, including the Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Serbia, Croatia, and Lithuania, will discuss the role churches played in the first decade of communism, that is the period 1945-1956. This was undoubtedly a difficult time for our homelands, a period of far-reaching communist repressions. The speakers will take a closer look at the situation of churches and religious associations. They will discuss, among other things, the religious policies of various countries behind the Iron Curtain, the actions of the Holy See, and the reaction of the churches to the repression. Important historical figures will also be introduced among them. Primate Stefan Wyszyński, Archbishop Aloysia Stepanic, Bishop Marton Aron, Bishop Pavel Goidic, and Bishop Kazimierz Dulbinskis. We will try to find the similarities and differences between the activities of the churches, the religious policies of the authorities, and the situation of the followers of particular churches. The management of the Institute of National Remembrance remains hopeful that this first in a series of international conferences will contribute to the further in-depth historical research. Perhaps it will soon be possible to prepare comparative scholarly studies that will provide a comprehensive look at the fate of churches and religious associations during the communist dictatorship in Central and Eastern Europe. On behalf of the President of the Institute of National Remembrance, I welcome you here in Warsaw. It's very important to see you together in our institution. Thank you very much for your coming. Thank you, Mr. President. And now I would like to invite the Reka Kish, the chairperson of the uh, NEP institution, to give an opening word in the name of the NEP. The floor is yours, uh, uh, Ms. Reka Kish. 
Thank you very much, dear distinguished colleagues. I would also like to welcome you on behalf of uh, the Committee of National Remembrance, the NEB, the Hungarian co-organizer of this conference series. I do think that this series and the cooperation between our institutions in, is indeed of um, great uh, uh, value. This certainly sounds rather trivial or, or, or conventional, but I think that sometimes the obvious things also need to be emphasized. Therefore, I would like to highlight three aspects to make, in my opinion, the series of symposium really valuable. First of all, because the very essence of, of academic work of, uh, is dialogue, the exchange of experiences, even debates, communication, and forums for this must be created. This seems very well self-evident, and we must be aware of that this is not self-evident. So we have, we have to appreciate our colleagues' work. So first of all, let's therefore look after these forums and thank the organizers for their tireless initiative. Secondly, Although we are talking more and more about the, the process of, of uh, uh, Sovietization and the functioning of the communist dictatorship, they are still far from being an integral part of our common European culture of memory and far from being a common uh, historical code. They are too closely related, but far from synonymous categories. And this is becoming increasingly important in the current situation, and is also prompting historians to rethink a number of questions in a nuanced way. For example, when we look at Stalinism in the 1950s, which phenomena were the resulting of the functioning of the Soviet empire, of the Soviet interests, of the essence of the empire, and which phenomena can be traced back to the Marxist communist ideology. What is each phenomenon the result of? How are the two related? And reflecting on these issues through the topic of anti-clericalism and religious persecution is also very actual because on the one hand we are witnessing tragic attempts at empire building and on the other hand we are witnessing many signs of a renaissance of neo-Marxist communist utopia, neo-Marxist communist ideology, including the increasing manifestation of anti-religion. It is therefore very appropriate to explore and raise awareness of the sometimes brutally violent, sometimes camouflaged uh, persecution of churches and religions, get to know its apparatus, its uh, modus operandi, its denomi denominational and national specificities that were present in the communist dictatorships and the Soviet time regimes as well. Looking through our program today and tomorrow, I think that we will have the opportunity to engage in a lively discussion all of these issues based on the diverse presentation of the symposium. And I would like to thank the organizers again and thank the IPN, the host, once again for their work. And I wish all of you a very beautiful conference. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Reika Kish, especially for the giving a direction which we should uh, provide in our research and uh, we should also um, giving us experience which we have. And now I w want to um, uh, invite the uh, uh, chairperson of the UPN, uh, Mr. Jego Sivos, to open the conference. Uh, the floor is yours. Dear Mr. Vice President, Madam President, dear colleagues, dear attendees, let me speak to you on behalf of the Slovak Nations Memory Institute at the opening ceremony of the, the International Scientific Conference dedicated to the persecution of churches and religious communities in the countries of Eastern Europe after Second World War. This is the second series of conferences organized by our three memory institutions. Our partner institutions have the same mission in their countries, 
to investigate and impartially evaluate the period marked by the rule of non-democratic regimes and to promote the values of freedom and democracy that returned to our geographical regions after the fall of the communist regimes in 1989. Our mutual cooperation is therefore natural and I'm very glad that it is not only taking place in the form of declarations and working negotiations, but also has, as we can see, concrete results. Persecution of churches and persecution of church dignitaries and believers were an integral part of the activities of the party and security forces of atheistic regimes. However, the situation was different in each country at the different stages of communist regimes. Their specifics and comparison can be found in the individual posts. I would like to thank the partners of the event, especially the Polish Institute of National Remembrance, for organizing the first year of the conference. I wish you all a successful conference, gaining new knowledge and stimulating discussions. Next year, we will be happy to welcome you in Bratislava, where the series of international scientific conferences on the persecution of churches will continue. If I can have a moment on the end of my speech, I would like to hand over uh, the commemorative medal of the Institute of Nations Memory Institute issued on uh, the occasion of the 20th anniversary of the activity to the president of the Institute of National Remembrance and of the Committee of National Remembrance. Thank you very much for these opening words by the presidents of three our institution. I hope that it will be a, a great moment to our cooperation, to that cooperation is not uh, closed and will also continue our series in the Bratislava and in the Budapest um, in the next and the next year. And now uh, in the two minutes we'll start the first panel of our conference and this panel will be held by Vice Director of the IPN Research Office, Konrad uh, Gatschik, PhD. Uh, Mr. Director, let's go and provide this panel. Thank you very much. I will, in, I will invite uh, our guests to take a seat. Uh, the first session will be about the uh, situation of the churches in, uh, in Yugoslavia, in uh, Croatia, and in Poland. I will uh, moderate the first the first session. And I will control the time, of course. Uh, 20 minutes for, uh, for speech, for the lecture. Uh, the first speech will uh, present uh, our guest from, uh, from Zagreb, uh, Miroslav Akmadza, PhD, and uh, Josip Mihailevich, PhD. Uh, 20 minutes. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, will this presentation be on, uh, yeah, on the monitor? Yeah. Yeah. Come on, here. And, uh, and uh, the microphone. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So, what is this? So, uh, first of all, thank you uh, all for coming, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for inviting us for this great conference. I would like to thank the organizers for for having us here, and uh, it's very pleasant to be and stay in Warsaw. 
So the uh, the topic f which will be uh, now uh, on the first in this panel, it's about the position of the Catholic Church in Communist Croatia from 1945 to 1952. Uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Akmanja and I wrote this paper together, and he gave me the honor to address you now with uh, with, with this presentation. So. Uh, first of all, I would like to reflect. Uh, okay, maybe this will be better. To reflect on the political conditions in Croatia and Yugoslavia after the Second World War. Well, the Yugoslav state was governed uh, by a single provisional Yugoslav government, which was established in March 1945, and it was headed by Josip Broz Tito, the first uh, Yugoslav uh, state in this period was called Democratic Federative Yugoslavia. On November, uh, in November 1945, uh, the elections for the Constituent Assembly were held, and then this, uh, uh, on these elections, uh, people elected Communist Party actually uh, behind the uh, People's Front. Actually, it was uh, the newly elected constituent assembly which abolished the monarchy and established a republic called Federative Republic of Yugoslavia. Uh, of course, Communist Party of Yugoslavia had absolute power in this uh, political uh, entity, so they operated through the People's Front and other mass organizations that were created for all the uh, areas of uh, human activity, for all uh, areas of society. Of course, they, will, uh, they had the instruments in um, repression. Society was monitored by the political police, which was uh, usual in all the communist uh, regimes at the time. Uh, it was called OSNA in the, in the first uh, couple of years. It was uh, Department for People's Protection, and it was renamed in 1946 in UDBA, which means State Security Administration. In January 1946, uh, Yugoslavia uh, adopted a new uh, uh, constitution, and in this constitution, it was uh, it was uh, defined that the Yugoslavia is a state with uh, uh, six republics. Croatia was one of people's republics, uh, um, along with uh, Republic of uh, Slovenia, um, Socialist Republic of Slovenia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Serbia, Montenegro, and uh, Macedonia. Of course, all this uh, period from the uh, last months of the Second World War and the first couple of years after the war, war uh, were a period, uh, was a period of mass arrests and killings of those who were considered enemies uh, of the people. Now I will reflect on the communism and religion and in Croatia to see what are the uh, reasons for this mistrust between the, um, these two uh, uh, phenomena? So, uh, first of all, Croatians uh, have a strong tradition, uh, strong Catholic tradition in, in, their, in their lives, and they are traditionally Catholics, most of them. Of course, and that meant that the uh, Catholic Church in Croatia was particularly uh, under attack by the new uh, communist government. Communists try to convey people of Croatia, not only of Croatia, but all the Yugoslav people, uh, that the Catholic Church was the greatest ally of the uh, Ustasha regime, so pro-fascist regime, which was uh, uh, which governed um, Croatia and uh, during the Second World War. So, although the uh, new government passed the declaration uh, on freedom of religion, this declaration was uh, rarely respected in uh, daily practice which will lead to tensions and uh, open conflict between the Catholic Church and the state and the government. So what are the uh, causes of this mistrust between the church and the um, uh, new state? Well, uh, the mistrust between them and uh, between church and the communists uh, was mutual and it was deeply, deeply rooted. Uh, first of all, the communist program had some aspects which were completely not acceptable to the uh, Catholic Church and uh, Church uh, in general. First of all, it, uh, the program uh, um, pronounced that the, the church should be separated from the state, that the school should be separated from the church, and also uh, one 
one another big issue was that uh, the program um, wanted to uh, conf confiscate the the church property because church had a, a big big uh, um, um, property in uh, not only in Croatia but in all all uh, uh, area of uh, Yugoslavia. So, of course, the the final goal of the of the Communist Party was to uh, eliminate the church from the uh, political life and social life uh, uh, as such. So, uh, on one side, of course, in church was not uh, uh, found with that program. Of course, in 1936, uh, Yugoslav Bishops Conference, uh, Catholic Bishops Conference, in 1936. Uh, declared that uh, communists uh, uh, want uh, uh, to, to, to invent hell in, in, in Yugoslavia. So they, I quote, uh, they, they said in that conference, 1936, that they want to protect their believers from this terrible danger to religion and civilization. On the other side, uh, at the same year, in the same year, Josip Broz Tito in November 1936 uh, said, I quote, According to our views on the world, we communists are carriers of dialectical materialism and, as such, atheists. Catholics are philosophically idealists. They believe in God and church dogmas. Among these two views on the world, confrontation is truly irreconcilable. So, this is very um, uh, fond. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's very clear that uh, the, the causes of mistrust uh, were deeply, deeply rooted between these two uh, institutions. One of the most important uh, Catholic uh, priests, uh, actually the, the most important Catholic priest in, in Croatia at that time was Archbishop of Zagreb, Aloysius Stepinac. He was very, very against uh, uh, communism. You can uh, read uh, many of his statements, many of his uh, uh, sermons where he, where he, where, where he uh, addressed that uh, communism is a one big threat to uh, not only to the church, but the whole, the whole system. For instance, in 1940, he said uh, he compared communists as a society of criminals. In 1941, and in his Easter sermon, he said that uh, communism is a negation of all truth and justice, and as such, the biggest obstacle to peace. Of course, in 1945, uh, before the war ended in uh, March, uh, he condemned communism as a doctrine and said that he would defend the freedom of the church and stand up for the right of the Croatian people to their own state because such a state was guaranteed for a religious freedom. This was uh, one of the claims which will be uh, for the communists and for the new government after the war. It will be very problematic and they will, they will uh, be, um, uh, it will be in the process against him, on the trial against him. It will, it will be one of the reasons why he was sentenced later. So, uh, the Catholic Church in Croatia was not happy with the idea of uh, creation of a new Yugoslav state. Considering the, the, the past with the first uh, dictatorship in the first monarchist Yugoslavia, they didn't want to, to uh, become uh, part of another Yugoslavia. Uh, bishops protested most strongly against the killings of Catholic priests and believers uh, and also they uh, wanted to uh, emphasize that the Croatian people accepted independent state of Croatia as a result of the uh, longing for their independent state. This attitude was later interpreted as the Catholic Church support for the Ustasha regime. And it was uh, for them very problematic and it ed ended up in, uh, in trial against uh, Stepinac. Uh, Priests and monks uh, in Catholic Church in Croatia uh, took sides in the war period, but only a small percentage of priests in Croatia joined the partisan movement, the, the movement which was uh, led by the communists of, and Josip Broz Tito. Only a small percent, percentage. Uh, for instance, there were 40 priests and two nuns actively participated in the partisan movement and less than 100 priests who, were, uh, who sympathized and helped the, the partisan 
movement. On the other side, from 1941 until 1945, between uh, 380 and, and 400 Catholic priests, monks and nuns were killed by uh, the partisans and communists. So in the final days of the war, those priests who did not want to, uh, to, to face the, the new government, didn't have the courage to face uh, the new government, communist government, left, left their homeland. Some of them, uh, like Archbishop of, of Bosnia, uh, Archbishop uh, Bishop of, uh, of uh, Ljubljana, and also uh, Bishop of Banja Luka. However, communists were cautious when they were dealing with Catholic Church, because Catholic Church had a great reputation and influence among the people. Um, educated clergy, uh, financially independent from the state, uh, as well as uh, church's international influence. These were all the reasons why the communists had to be more careful when they uh, uh, face against the Catholic Church. So, uh, on the other side, uh, the communist government saw the Catholic Church as a possible center for political opposition in Yugoslavia. And of course, uh, uh, they uh, wanted to eliminate the influence of the Holy See on the Catholic Church in uh, Yugoslavia. Um, the idea of people's church was something that Tito tried to, to do in uh, Yugoslavia, uh, even with the Catholic Church. He tried to separate the Catholic Church in Yugoslavia from the Holy See. Uh, he wanted to he wanted to uh, uh, um, to create a so-called people's church, on which the state would uh, have as much influence as possible, even if it was formally um, under the jurisdiction of Rome. So, uh, it is, which is very interesting, in 1949, at the reception of uh, some priests who were um, who were who sympathized with the new regime, Tito said, "Why don't you separate from Rome?" Like like we did from uh, Moscow, uh, implying that uh, Yugoslav government uh, broke their relations with Moscow in 1948. Um, another big thing is that Croatian priests, Croatian bishops, and Archbishop uh, Stepinac had the opportunity to uh, collaborate with the new government. Uh, Yugoslav diplomat Vladimir Popović, uh, in a conversation with the uh, Croatian uh, sculptor Ivan Mestrović, said that if he, Stepinac, had only declared the Croatian Church separated from Rome, he would have raised we would have raised him to the clouds, meaning that he will he will be the um, the the man uh, with the regime. So, but he didn't do that, and on the other side, they. Uh, Catholic Church in Croatia uh, published a pastoral letter on the, of, in September 1945. Uh, uh, it was uh, this. Uh, at, this was published by the um, bishops' conference in um, in September in Zagreb, and they wrote a pastoral letter to their believers. But uh, this letter was uh, had big reactions from the from the government. Uh, the bishops referred to the killings and arrests of priests and uh, the issues of youth education, uh, confrontation of church, property, and so, and so on. But the reactions were uh, very, very negative from the uh, government side. Uh, Tito himself spoke about this letter, and in his criticism of this letter, he said that the bishops did not publish such a letter during the Ustasha regime, implying that they were uh, collaborating with that regime. So tensions between, uh, tensions between the Catholic Church and the new government uh, grew, uh, and that led to frequent uh, incidents. Um, one of the biggest incidents happened in November 1945 when Archbishop Stepinac was, uh, was attacked. And after the Communist Party took power in November 1945, they uh, started to prepare uh, for the final showdown, I will say. In December 1945, Vladimir Bakaric, the head of Croatian communists, announced the beginning of the, uh, I quote, campaign against priests. 
Yeah, thank you. Many anti-church laws were adopted at the time, of course, and the new constitution of Yugoslavia in 1946 separated the church from the from the state. Of course, court proceedings were um, were massive at the time. Uh, several bishops and a high official of Catholic Church were were uh, um, were at trial. Uh, many of them uh, ended up in prison, and of course, the Stepina trial was most uh, most famous at the time. Tito concluded that all attempts to influence the peanuts were unsuccessful, and then he, and then he uh, decided to uh, to go against him. Of course, uh, he was sentenced on uh, to 16 years in um, prison with forced labor and the loss of political rights for five years. Although Stepinac was uh, uh, transferred from the prison in Lepoglava to uh, house arrest in 1951. The final uh, uh, try to um, to break the church unity and to bring church under governmental influence was the establishing establishing of the priest associations. Um, most of uh, most of those priests who sympathize with the uh, with the communist government uh, joined those associations, but many of them were blackmailed and uh, they were threatened by imprisonment, etc. So uh, the uh, establishing of priest association was an was a act of uh, the government. In Croatia, this, this, uh, this process failed because um, Croatian, um, Croatian bishops uh, anonymously passed the statement called non licet, meaning it's forbidden to um, to associate in such a in such associations. In, cost, in contrast to Yugos, uh, to Croatia, in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Slovenia, they had some success. And finally, um, all these tensions uh, severed the diplomatic relations between Yugoslavia and the the, the Holy See and. Uh, Direct reason for breaking those uh, relations was uh, when uh, uh, Radio Vatican published a list of new cardinals in 1952, uh, in which a name of Archbishop the Peanuts was included. That was the final, uh, final uh, breakdown between the Yugoslav government and the Catholic Church. So, uh, in December 1952, Yugoslav side uh, uh, broke those. Uh, diplomatic relations between Yugoslavia and Hosi. So to conclude, uh, the communist regime headed uh, by Tito tried to influence the church, uh, to weaken the ties with the Holy See, and to form a, a people's church that would be under the supervision uh, of the uh, new, new government. And uh, by imprisoning uh, Archbishop Stepinas, the government still failed to bring the Catholic Church under its control and caused even worse image of the Yugoslav regime in the world. So the last attempt was the, the establishment of the priest associations, which, which also failed. And that was the, uh, the, the, the most difficult uh, reasons why these relations between Holy See and uh, Yugoslavia broke down in 1952. So thank you very much. And, um, Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, report from your research. Uh, and thank you very much for respecting the time. It's important. Uh, we will hear about the uh, situation in Yugoslavia after World War II. Uh, Professor Aleksandar Zivotic from Belgrade. The floor is yours. Thank you. Dear colleagues, dear friends, uh, today I will speak about uh, Soviet efforts to influence on the social and political positioning of the Serbian Orthodox Church in Serbian and Yugoslav society during the first uh, post-war decade through the Russian Orthodox Church. Actually, I will try to answer the question to what extent did Soviet diplomacy uh, use the Russian Orthodox Church as an instrument to strengthen the position of the new revolutionary government in the period of close alliance, and then as a possible element of its uh, destabilization during the conflict between Yugoslavia and states of common form. Uh, at first, 
uh, the beginning of the Second World War uh, was uh, met by the Serbian Orthodox Church in the positions of unwavering anti-fascism and anti-communism. The occupation division of the Yugoslav territory, the annexation of the part of its, its territory by neighboring countries, as well as the creation of satellite structures on its soil, determined the fate of the Serbian Orthodox Church during the war. The beginning of civil war on the territory of Yugoslavia, uh, and especially on the territory of Serbia, conflict between two rivalry uh, movements complicated the already difficult position of the Serbian Orthodox Church. A clear anti-communist stance in relation to, to the partisan movement, the majority agreeing with the royalist movement and partly with the quizzing authorities of General Nedic, determined the political position of the church. On the other hand, the persecution of the territory of the newly created independent state of Croatia and the expulsion of the clergy from parts of the country annexed by Bulgaria, along with the destruction of churches and uh, monasteries, made the, the position of the church extremely difficult. In the last phase of the war, the victorious uh, partisan uh, movement clashed with the opponents of the revolution, in which a significant number of Orthodox priests died as supporters of the defeated forces. During the war, a smaller part of the Orthodox clergy sided with the partisans, making at the end of war a powerful lever of influence for the new authorities within the church. The leadership of the church itself was uh, beheaded at the end of the war. Many bishops died, in the war, uh, died during the war. Some went into exile as a strange opponents of the communists, while the patriarch himself waited for the end of the war in German concentration camp, after which he refused to return to Belgrade. Uh, on the other hand, the Russian Orthodox Church improved its position during the Second World War. Stalin's decision to reallow the election of the patriarch, reduce the repression of the Orthodox Church, and use the church as an additional means of the inter internal co cohesion of society in difficult years of the war, turned the Russian Orthodox Church into one of the important factors of the consolidations of Soviet influence in Eastern Europe, European countries at the end of the Second World War, especially those of a dominantly Orthodox character. In those circumstances, Yugoslavia was an extremely specific country. Although by nature a multi-confessional country, the Orthodox population was a relative majority. The traditional political and cultural influence of the church within the Serbian corps made the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church an important factor during the process of consolidations of uh, authority of the Yugoslav Communist Party. Such uh, a need was particularly pronounced in the east, uh, east part of the country, the area of the former Kingdom of Serbia until 1912, uh, uh, where the influence of the church was extremely strong and the resistance to the new government extremely pronounced. For this reason, already in the fall of 1944, at the height of the struggle for Serbia, the Soviet side estimated that getting the church on its side would be extremely important to stabilize the situation in Serbia in which the Russian Orthodox Church should have played an important role. The first steps on this plan were taken immediately after the liberation of Belgrade uh, on first dates of November 1944 with the exchange of letters between the Russian Patriarch and Metropolitan Yosif who represented the Serbian Patriarch Gavril. It uh, was instead on the depth of mutual church ties and the early patronage of the Serbian over the Russian church abroad in the interwar period. The first demonstration of Soviet influence on the political situation in uh, Serbia and Yugoslavia was related to the mediation during the return of Patriarch Gavrilo to Belgrade. Since Mitropolit Josif acted strongly anti-communism, emphasized that Josif Broz wanted to control the Serbian church in the same vein that Stalin controlled the Russian one. Uh, his actions became irritated, ir irritating uh, for the new government. For this reason, efforts have been uh, intensified in our order to return patriarch. This also uh, coincided with the aspiration of the majority of the clergy who saw the patriarch's return as a sort of barrier to Moscow's uh, so-called aspirations to establish Bolshevik papism. 
For this reason, the Russian church, through the, uh, its exarch in Czechoslovakia, established a connection with Patriarch Gavrilo, who at the, that moment was undergoing treatment in Karlovy Vary. During the conversation on September 15, 1946, the Serbian Patriarch stated that the Russian Patriarch act wisely by recognizing the authority, that the terrible uh, brought the church out of a difficult situation and reduced the pressure of its uh, communists on it. To the Russian instance, uh, that he could do the same, he replied that there was a difference between the Serbian and Russian cases, but that he would think about everything how much Russian mediation influenced the patriarch decision to return to the country is difficult to say, but it is uh, quite clear that he understood the role of the Russian church in the Soviet system and the essence of the relationship between the church and the state in the Soviet Union. Considering the nature of new authorities and their ideological attachment to the Soviet Union, it was not difficult for him to conclude what challenge uh, the Serbian church was facing. After that, the sober and realistic Patriarch Gavrilo concluded that the church must necessarily find a compromise with the state leadership and that it must avoid conflicts with the authorities. For its part, obviously under Soviet influence, the government sent signals to the Patriarch that he would pursue a policy of cooperation with the church. Both the Russian church and the Yugoslav authorities directly encouraged the Patriarch, uh, Patriarch's Slavophilic feelings as well as the hope that he would stop further suffering of the church in cooperation with the authorities. After his return to the country, in talks with the part of clergy who were close to the authorities, he emphasized his determination that, as he said, the church must serve uh, to God, the people, and the state, and that he is ready to lead a policy of agreement with the state authorities in order to restore uh, the church and strengthen its position. The Slavophil settlements of the Serbian Patriarch came to the uh, fore during meetings with Soviet representatives in Belgrade, as well as, as uh, with Tito himself. He supported the idea of unification of Slavic peoples and is insisted on his visit to Moscow, which Tito supported on the condition that he received an official invitation uh, from the Moscow Patriarch. Uh, in his speech at uh, a Slavic uh, Congress in Belgrade in December 1946, uh, the Patriarch emphasized the, the, the need for orientation towards uh, Mother Russia. Uh, and uh, on the sidelines of the Congress, he promised that the representatives of the Russian church that he was ready to support them in the fight, as uh, he said, with the Vatican and the fight against ecum ecumenism and asked for an invitation to visit Moscow in, in order to further discuss uh, this, uh, these issues. On the other hand, according to many testimonies, he feared the intention of Russian church to rule all other Orthodox churches. Partly because of these fears and partly because of the resistance of the significant part of bishops, the Patriarch postponed his visit to Moscow, for which he received an uh, invitation in uh, April 1947, and after that he received approval. Uh, Russian church uh, dignitaries noticed that the Serbian Patriarch's enthusiasm for relations with the Russian church uh, had fallen, Postponing the visit to Moscow influenced the growth of a mistrust of the Soviet state authorities. Uh, it was a council for the affairs of the Russian Orthodox Church towards the Serbian Patriarch. It was estimated uh, that he was influenced by British and Americans through the Bishop of Metropolit Yosif. It was assumed that the Patriarch has no confidence in the strength of uh, the new Yugoslavia and that he does not really on the clergy, which strives to cooperation between the church and the state government. Patriarch Gavrilo's visit to Moscow took place at the moment of the flare up of the Yugoslav Soviet conflict. He visited Moscow in July 1948 to participate in the meeting of the all Orthodox leaders. Apparently against uh, his uh, will, he gave 
in under the pressure of the government, which in this way wanted to demonstrate its determination to de-escalate de the conflict that uh, had started. The patriarch in Moscow himself opposed the intentions of the Russian church to create an, uh, an exarchate in Hungary and refused to sign the proclamations against atomic weapons and condemning imperialism, pointing out that it is not the church's business. Uh, in talks with Soviet officials in Moscow, he emphasized his uh, dissatisfaction with the Tito, the communist and positioning of the Orthodox Church in Yugoslavia. From the Soviet side, it was concluded that the Serbian patriarch considered the Soviet policy towards Yugoslavia correct. Uh, he apostrophized that Yugoslav authorities uh, should emulate the Soviet ones, especially in relations to the church. In the conditions, uh, of the conflict with uh, Yugoslavia, official Moscow extremely uh, valued the patriarch's position regarding the conflict with the Vatican and the fight against ecumenism. Also, she believed uh, that his views could be useful, used to spread Soviet influence among Orthodox believers in Yugoslavia. They especially viewed with the sympathy his views on the nature of the Yugoslav-Soviet conflict, the origin of which he openly blamed the Yugoslav side. During subsequent meetings with Soviet representatives in Belgrade, the Patriarch complained about the position of the church in society and bad relations with authorities, while Soviet uh, diplomats tried to fuel uh, his discontent by spreading unfounded hopes that he uh, would receive all kinds of Soviet help. Regarding the Yugoslav-Soviet uh, Yugoslav conflict, Patriarch Gavrilo emphasized that the church will never condemn in common form because, in his opinion, that would mean condemning Russia, the Soviet Union, and the Moscow Patriarchate. The sudden death of Patriarch Gavrilo and the arrival of Patriarch Vikentia in 1940 led to change. The new patriarch did not follow a policy of confrontation with state authorities. His election caused great interest in Moscow, especially regarding his views on the Moscow and the ecumenical patriarchates. It firmly stood on the point of view that it is about installation of Tito's regime, which will strictly implement a line close to the policy of the state authorities. The attitude of the Soviet side towards Patriarch Vikenti and the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church began to change only after Stalin's death and the first signs of normalization or relations between the two countries. At the end of 1953, the Soviet state authorities allowed the Moscow Patriarch to start regular communication to protocol nature with the Serbian Patriarch and the Serbian Orthodox Church. It was a major change in the Soviet approach that was in line with the beginnings of the normalization of mutual relations. The privileged view was the overall situation in Yugoslavia, and especially the church situation could not be influenced through the Moscow Patriarchy. Um, as um, I can conclude, at the end of the Second World War, Soviet diplomacy through the Russian Orthodox Church tried to influence the Serbian Orthodox Church not to interfere with the consolidation of new communist government, especially in the areas of central Serbia. Uh, they had significant uh, success in that in the moments when the Yugoslav-Soviet conflict began in 1940. Um, Eight, the Soviet side tried to use dissatisfaction of the Serbian Patriarch and the Serbian Orthodox Church with the government's attitude towards them in order to destabilize Tito's regime. The undertaking was unsex unsuccessful, but the beginning of the normalization of mutual relations after Stalin's death opened, uh, we can say, a new chapter in Serbian-Russian church ties uh, in that period. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your speech. Uh, uh, we saved some time, a few minutes. Uh, this will be, the discussion can be <laughs> longer. Um, we will go to, uh, to church in Poland during communism. Uh, Professor Arafa Watka from IPN from Warsaw will speak about uh, primates of Poland and the communist system. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I would like to say in the uh, 
uh, first few words that in the realities of the post-war communist Poland, the Catholic Church played a very important role, the more so that after the changes of border as a result of the World War II, Poland was ba basically a country of one Roman uh, Catholic uh, denomination. The most important role in the activity of the church was played by two Polish by Master Polish Cardinal. The first one, it was a Cardinal August Lund until 1948, and as, as Bishop Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński after 1948. And in these two figures, and their approach to be uh, to the communist system, um, that is the paper will be devoted to. For obvious reason, uh, this will only the, be only an uh, outline of the issue, as the subject is very extensive and complicated. Uh, so um, the evidence of this is that about payment of Poland, we had uh, more than uh, 100 books, which is only a monographic studies about Paimat Wyszyński. Cardinal August Lund uh, is unjustly so hard uh, forgotten figure uh, uh, in Poland. This is mainly due to the overshadowing uh, of his achievements by his successor, um, the great primate Cardinal Stefan Wyszyński, and also by accusation uh, that in the 1939, um, Cardinal Lund left the nation in need, evacuating with the government uh, from Poland on the beginning of the World War II. After the end of military operation in 1950, uh, 1945, Paimant uh, went to the Vatican and uh, where he obtained a special powers and attorney uh, uh, from Pope Pius um, uh, XII. Thanks to them, uh, to which uh, he was able to sort of the situation of the um, church in Poland. He returned to his homeland in the jolly 1945. Cardinal Lechlund began uh, his uh, attorney in Poland on July um, 20 in Poznań. He returned to the country which was badly damaged by war. The Catholic Church also suffered huge losses. Thousands of priests were killed. Many churches were demolished or damaged. A large part of diocese were, was the brief of bishops and functioning curias. A great challenge was also to organize organization of church structures in the western and northern territories annexed to Poland after the uh, World War II. On August 15, the primate um, uh, decided to establish a church organization in these areas. Thanks to the special uh, powers, he established five apostolic administration in Wroclaw, Opole, Gorzów, Olsztyn, and Gdańsk, appointing an administrator of each of them. This met with protest and resistance on part of the Germany influential hierarchy. Um, Cardinal uh, Lund, however, didn't intend to change his decision, believing that it was of key importance uh, for the activities of the church and the Polish resident uh, the state. Uh, he was also fully aware that great challenges faces by priests working in the recovery territories. In a statement addressed to apostolic administrators on August 1945, he emphasized, um, quote, you will have worthy of a worthy of history. We start at ex nihilo with bare hands. You should believe in divine providence and its help of the most holy mother, as well in the ability of our nation. We are returning to the old ways of history, uh, to all these historic sites, Wrocław, Kołobrze, Kamień, Pomorski, Opole, um, Providence, and trust uh, us with no small talks. The activities of the primate in the western and northern territories were accepted by the Pope um, Pius XII um, after the explanation he made in the Vatican in the November 1946. 
Uh, payment loan not only re reorganized the church administration on the recovery territories, but also filled many vacant episcopal sees, a reorgan reorganization the structure of the church in the central and eastern Poland. In the years 1936 to 1938, uh, he uh, consecrated 10 bishops, many of them play uh, an important role in the activities of the church in the next three or four uh, decades. Uh, his key, uh, key achievement was also the appointment of the main commission of Polish Episcopate and uh, gradual development of unity in the activities of the Polish uh, bishops. This was particularly important uh, in the terms of attitude towards the communist uh, state. Um, uh, uh, the above mentioned main commission was established during the meeting of the Episcopate in the October 1945. It could independently make the most important decision uh, of the Polish Church, especially in the sphere of the relation with the communist uh, state, um, prepared a plenary meeting of Episcopate, develop guidelines and outlines in the pastoral and official letters uh, communique, um, which uh, can be uh, uh, underlined and mentioned in the relations with the communist state. An important turning point of the primate ministry of Cardinal uh, Hlond was the dissolution of the personal union of the Archidiocese of Poznań and Gniezno, which took place on March 1946. The Pope uh, then appointed the primate of the Metropolitan of Warsaw, leaving him also the functioning of the Metropolitan of Gniezno. This solution became established and was used in the nomination of his successors, um, Cardinals uh, Wyszyński and um, Cardinal Józef Glemp. It results mainly from the conviction that the permanent presence of the leader of the Polish Church in the capital of the states was necessary in the face of further hostile action of the communist authorities. Ingress of the Warsaw Cathedral of uh, Cardinal Flond took place on uh, May uh, 30 uh, and the uh, hierarch set at this time. This Warsaw which, good, uh, which got assigned uh, to me a mystical bride, uh, it's some great challenge. The greatest mission of my life, uh, the announcement of something huge, which was, um, which were, were hard to fulfill, and experience in the heart of the Republic of Poland. And uh, this greatness of the, um, is the kingdom of the God in Polish souls and uh, in the life of the nation. Ingress was a great manifestation of Poles, attachment to the church, thousands of faithfuls uh, participate in, in it. Indeed, the Warsaw stage of the priest uh, ministry of Cardinal Hlond was associated with many uh, challenges, especially in the um, field of the state rela uh, church relation. The primate presented an adamant uh, stance toward the authorities. He also had absolutely no illusion about the communists, considering the rule imposed by the Soviet Union and having no social uh, support. He protested about, against the falsification of the 1946 referendum. He asserted that Kelce program is uh, as an event of the least partly inspired by the authorities and carried out with the uh, participation of the functionaries of the secret, uh, security uh, apparatus. He considered that the action of the uh, legis legislative uh, uh, to be uh, un unlawful. After the communists organized fraudulent election in January, in January 1947, in the, con uh, in the conversation with Cardinal Adam Sef uh, Stefan Sapieha, uh, he stated, we must be aware that the elections were on an act of the great terror, um, fraud and lies. Uh, this is a general view of the elections of the, at the home uh, and abroad. On October 1948, the payment suddenly fell ill. The disease progressed rapidly. Two operations performed were unsuccessful, and nine days after that, Hlon died. 
there was suspicion that he must be poisoned, but uh, though to date no evidence has been found to confirm this thesis. The bishop passed away to the Lord in extremely difficult moment of the anti-church um, offensive um, of the communist authorities. The Primadul was taken over by Archbishop Wyszyński, who was effecti effectively leading church for the next 33 years. The achievements of the um, last three years of the Cardinal Flond uh, era it was rich and, in my opinion, needs regular reminding. The most important achievements of the primate include um, establishing a church organization um, in the western and northern territories, organizing uh, church structures in the central and eastern Poland, developing a model of activity um, for the Polish Episcopate, uh, state attitude toward the authority of people Poland. Thanks to this activity of Cardinal Flond, who built solid foundation for the activity of the church in the difficult realities of the communist dictatorship, a long and fruitful pontificate of Stefan Wyszyński become um, possible. Now, um, uh, short, um, short uh, few words about uh, the primate Wyszyński and his attitude to the communist system. The new primate began his activity in the January 1949. As it turned out, uh, he led the Polish church for total 33 years until the death in 1981. Ingress to Gniezno and Warsaw took place uh, at the beginning of the February 1949. In a pastoral letter addressed to the faithfuls from this um, occasion, he uh, underlined like this, quote, Do I still have to, in to introduce myself to you? Uh, I'm, not a, uh, uh, I'm neither a politician nor a diplomat. I am neither activist or a uh, reformer, but instead I am your priest, shepherd, and bishop of your souls. I am apostle of Jesus Christ. My mission is priestly, pastoral, and apostolic missions stemming the, from God's eternal thoughts, uh, from the um, uh, salvic will of the uh, Father, joyfully sharing his happiness with man. The primate emphasized that uh, he continues the activities of the, his decased predecessor. He kept his most important collaborators with uh, him. He took up uh, the work of rebuilding the ruined church of Warsaw and Gniezno, um, intimidated the, uh, by his predecessor, including the Warsaw Cathedral. Um, Cardinal Wyszyński always placed the nation above the, the state. This resulted from the um, bishop's belief in the, po the Polishness was more permanent and much, much more deeply rooted in reality than any administrative structures established by citizens, especially from the uh, communist, uh, from uh, po Poland and Soviet communists. The primate assessed that the political and systematic changes brought about the, by the end of World War II would prove more durable than one generation, and the situation in which Poland uh, found itself would not change in the uh, nearest future. For this reason, he believed the church was forced to work out a, a kind of modus vivendi um, with the communists, which would enable uh, this institution to carry out uh, its personal pastoral mission. The assumption resulted in the conclusion in April 1950, uh, 1950 of the agreement with the authorities of communist uh, Poland, um, which guarantee the Catholic Church in Poland uh, a strong connection with the Holy See and the possibility of conducting pastoral activities. The price for this weighed the support of the Episcopal for the collectivization of agriculture and condemnation the armed activity of the independence underground. At the same time, uh, as Bishop Wyszyński didn't agree to use the church by the authorities um, to legitimize the system and try to avoid situation that could be perceived in the 
this way by Polish society. He also uh, cont uh, counteracted attempts to sub subordinate the clergy to the state. This was reflected in the famous non posthumous letter um, sent to the authorities in May 1953 um, from the initiative of the primate, uh, which uh, they protested against the decret of the uh, feeding every church appointment of the consensus of the communists. In addition to the disagreement of Cardinal Wyszyński for the a condemnation of the bishops, uh, Bishop Czesław Kaczmarek, it was main reason for the arrest of the primate uh, in the September 1953. Uh, in this period of the imprisonment, which uh, took three years, the primate was in the um, few isolation uh, position, uh, few isolation places like Rybaut, Stoczek, Barmiński, Prudnik, and Komańcza. At the time, the primate was deprived of the all rights, even due to the person who are imprisoned. During this period, he was under intensive surveillance with help of the wiretap sent uh, secret ag ag agents. His correspondence was limited, and letters from the family were carefully cut and the fragments glued together. It happened that the uh, prisoners, uh, uh, Father Stanisław Skorodecki, a priest from the Archidiocese of Lviv, and Sister Leonia Graczyk from the congregation of the Sister of Family uh, of Mary. The payment in both these uh, places was subjected to constant surveillance. Regular daily reports on his behavior and activity were sent to the headquarters of the security apparatus in um, uh, was, uh, Warsaw. He was also denounced by the by the, the agents of his imprisonment companions. Father Skorodecki, it was a source uh, on the name Christina, and Sister Graczyk, it was a source of political police on the name Ptaszyńska and Kruszyna. More potentially incriminating information was brought in the last uh, was brought by the denunciation of the priest who primate uh, seem uh, trust more. More uh, freedom Cardinal Wyszyński uh, have in the last place of entertainment in Comanche. During the imprisonment, Cardinal Wyszyński met a personal dedication to the maternal captivity of Mary and developed the assumption of the program of the great novena and millennium of the baptism of Poland. Inspired by Maria Koinska, he formulated the text of the Jasna Góra uh, Wolves and the, of the Polish uh, nation. At the end of the October 1956, of the recommendation of the first secretary of the um, Communist Party, Władysław Gomułka, the two representatives representative of the uh, state authorities, Zenon Kliszko and Władysław Bienkowski, came to Komancza and informed the church, um, the chairman of Polish Episcopal, um, about the uh, end of the isolation and ask of the quick uh, return to the capital of Poland. The parliament presented the um, communist delegate with a condition of his return, including uh, he demands the release of the other bishops and the term of the church here to their home diocese. The cancellation of the decree of feeding church position and the resumption of the work of mixing um, commission of the episcopate and the government. His conditions were met. Cardinal Wyszyński returned to the capital of Poland in October 1956, um, greeted enthusiastically by the faithfuls. After his release, he resumed his pastoral activities for the benefit of the church in Poland, he conduct talks with the authorities. As a result, uh, which on the December 1956, new uh, so-called small agreement uh, were um, uh, decreted. Uh, going to the summary, Primat Slont and Wyszyński played a, a key uh, role in the surveying the difficult period of anti-church um, repressions carried out by the communist authorities from the 1945. 
The main factors of the day's success were a prudent concept of action, a focus on pastoral message, perseverance in the defending the independence of the church, and special powers of attorney granted by the Holy See, which they were used, which were able to use properly. In fact, um, it was in the years 1945-1956 that the foundation of the future stench, the Polish church, were laid, which was revelated with all of the mites um, of the celebration of the millennium of Polish Christianity in the years 1966-1967 and October um, 1978, when Cardinal Karol Wojtyła being a pope. But this is a, a story for the next another conference. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I'm very glad I hear my name in your speech uh, twice. <laughs> it's not a very good name. About Sister uh, Graczyk. Uh, um, we will take uh, uh, last uh, report from Professor Mirosław Szumiło. Uh, about uh, it it's will be bio biographical uh, report uh, from uh, situation of uh, church in in communist Poland. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, the subject of my paper will be profiles of people who, in the first uh, period of communist rule in Poland, uh, were responsible for state policy towards the Catholic Church. Uh, curators and supervisors. Uh, they had a conclusive influence on the decisions made and action uh, taken against the church, uh, uh, or they headed uh, the institutions implementing this policy. Uh, three main institutional uh, levels can be distinguished in this regard. Uh, first, the leadership of the Communist Party. Uh, the Polish Workers' Party and then the Polish United Workers' Party. Uh, that is the Politburo and the Secretariat of the Central Committee. Mm. The second, uh, the security apparatus, the, in Poland the Ministry of Public Security. And uh, the third, the state administration until 90. 40, the Ministry of Public Administration, and later the Office of Re for Religious Affairs. Uh, the key decisions of the, on the policy directions uh, of the communist authorities in all areas of life were taken by the communist party leadership, namely the Politburo and the Secretariat. Uh, these uh, two bodies uh, in practice linked together uh, numbered a dozen people in total in this period. And initially there was no specific person designated with over responsibility for church affairs, uh, nor was there a permanent commission also. Uh, the ad hoc commissions uh, set up to prepare the principles of anti-church policy. Uh, each included several members of the Politburo and representative of the state institutions. The leaders of the Polish Workers' Party, Władysław Gomułka and Bolesław Bierut, uh, had a, an important voice. In the years 1949-1950, uh, uh, when uh, key program decisions uh, were made concerning the fight against the church, uh, this issue in the Politburo was dealt with mainly by Jakub Berman. Uh, together with Bolesław Bierut and Hilary Mintz, uh, Berman was part of the triumvirate uh, practically ruling the party and the state. Uh, he was in fact man responsible for the activities of the security apparatus, uh, foreign policy and the entire ideological front, propaganda, education, and culture. Berman came from a petit bourgeois Jewish family and was the son of a shop owner in Warsaw. Uh, he received a solid education. Uh, he gradu graduated from the University of Warsaw with a degree in law. 
uh, and uh, he he was fluent in several foreign languages, Russian, English, German, and French. Before 1939, uh, he worked as a journalist for the Jewish Telegraphic Agency. Uh, as an intellectual, he was assimilated into Polish culture, but he retained strong links with the Jewish community. In personal questionnaires uh, for the Comintern, he declared uh, his Jewish nationality and fluency in Yiddish. Uh, before joining the Communist Party, he belonged to the Jewish Union of Academic Socialist Yaf Pochodnia, Torch. Uh, interestingly, uh, with the party approval, he took a religious uh, Jewish wedding. In my opinion, uh, the fact that Berman had no ties, familial or social, with the um, Polish Catholic or more broadly Christian community in Poland was important uh, for his political career. Uh, thanks to this, uh, he enjoyed the confidence of the Soviet authorities. From 1941 to 43. Uh, he was head of the Polish group at the Comintern School. Um, from July uh, 44, he was part of the narrow ruling body of Poland. Uh, as a confidant of Moscow, he became the man responsible for fighting the Catholic Church. Berman, Berman played key role in developing the assumptions of anti-church policy policy in 1949-50, uh, uh, when the authorities' offensive uh, against the church was begin beginning. He repeatedly uh, referred to the situation in the clergy section at the party leadership meetings. He spoke at briefings for party journalists and executives of the security apparatus. Berman reported extensively on actions against the church in person to the Soviet ambassador in Warsaw, Viktor Lebedev. Uh, by the early 50s, Berman, Berman's gradual relegations to the background was visible uh, as a result of Stalin's anti-Semitic obsession at the time. Uh, Berman was a candidate for the Polish Rudolf Slansky. Uh, during this period, uh, the so-called efforts of the clergy were taken over in the party leadership by the secretary of the Central Committee, Franciszek Mazur. Uh, he came from a Catholic family of Polish origin, but Ukrainized. Uh, he grew up in the countryside of in Ukrainian Podolia, and uh, he took uh, part in the revolution in Russia as a member of the Bolshevik party. Um, Mazur then served as a Soviet official in Ukraine for many years. In a questionnaire from uh, 1932 for Comintern, he declared Ukrainian nationality. Uh, it was only in 1945 that he clearly identified himself as a Pole. Uh, Mazur was essentially a Soviet man. After graduating from law school in Kharkov, uh, he served as a president of the Supreme Court of the Ukrainian Soviet Socialist Republic, uh, and then as a head of the department uh, in the People's Commissariat of Education of that republic. Uh, in 1940, uh, 30, uh, by a decision of the Comintern, he was sent on illegal party work to Poland. In 1940, uh, Mazur was arrested by the NKVD and sentenced for Trotskyism. He was uh, released from the Gulag uh, in uh, 45, thanks to Bierut's intervention with the Soviet authorities. He was judged by his Polish comrades uh, to be a mentally broken man and a man with strong ties to Moscow. Mm. Mazur enjoyed the confidence of Moscow and had considerable party experience. Uh, this probably determined uh, that in the division of duties in the Secretariat of Central Committee, he was entrusted with church 
affairs, officially from uh, 52. During this time, there was another wave of attacks on the church, among others, primate uh, Wyszyński was imprisoned. The implementation of the most repressive uh, measures against the church was handled by the Ministry of Public Security. Within its structure was the key department, uh, the fifth, sociopolitical. It had an extremely uh, wide range of competences. It dealt with the surveillance and dissection of all social and political organizations, state administration, trade unions, culture and educational institutions, uh, the Catholic Church and other religious associations. The director of the fifth department was Julia Bristiger, uh, considered to be the most influential woman, not only in the Stalinist period, but also in the entire history of the People's Republic of Poland. Uh, she came from a petit bourgeois family, being the daughter of a Jewish pharmacist uh, from Stry in Eastern Galicia. In her questionnaires, she always stated Polish nationality, Jewish origin. Uh, Julia graduated in history from the Jan Kazimierz University in Lwów. Uh, and she spoke Russian, Ukrainian, German, French, and Yiddish well. Uh, and she was a distinguished communist. <clears throat> Julia Bristiger's major role in shaping the main directions of security activity is evidenced, for example, by the fact that she presented program papers at meetings for members of the leadership of the security apparatus. Uh, in October 1947, uh, she presented the core program paper, The Clergy Offensive and Our Tasks. In addition, she was repeatedly invited to Politburo meetings. In fact, her position was even higher, as uh, she often contacted uh, Bolesław Bierut or Jakub Berman directly on various matters. She maintained close social relations with them. At the beginning of 1953, following a reorganization of the structure of the Ministry of Public Security, a separate Department 11 was created to combat the church. Karol Wienckowski, Jul uh, Julia Bristiger's former deputy, became its director. Uh, he represented the younger generation of uh, communists. Uh, he was born into a Polish working class family in Lwów, uh, graduated secondary school. In 1941, he volunteered for the Red Army, and then uh, he served in the NKVD troops and the Soviet partisans in Belarus. From uh, 1945, he worked for the security apparatus and enjoyed a very good reputation in communist circles. Administrative control over uh, various aspects of the church activities was exercised by the state institution until 1950, uh, 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 this was the Minister of Public Administration. Uh, Władysław Wolski, the Deputy Minister and from January uh, 49 Minister, uh, was responsible uh, there for religious matters and contact with the Catholic bishops. Uh, he came from a Polish uh, working family from Warsaw. He had only completed a vocational school and already became involved in the communist movement during the years of the First World War. Uh, like Mazur, Wolski spent five years in Soviet labor camps, accused of counter-revolutionary activities. An opinion from the Comintern concluded that he was not, not worthy of trust. Nevertheless, uh, after he, his release from the Gulag, he held a responsible position in state apparatus in Poland. There are many indications that he was an agent of the NKVD. Because of this past, he may have been blackmailed as a slow tool in Soviet hands. Uh, his career came to, to a sudden end 
1950 when he spoke in Central Committee Plenum to criticize the party leadership. Volsky was probably inspired by Ambassador Lebedev, but the Kremlin did not ultimately support this action and Volsky had to leave the power elite. In 1950, the Office for Religious Affairs was established with the task of coordinating the state's religious policy. Uh, another distinguished communist, Antoni Bida, became its director. He came from a peasant family from the Lublin area, uh, graduated in law, and he was a journalist by profession. Uh, from an, uh, an early age, Bida was active in communist organization. From uh, 45, he held managerial positions, uh, among other things. Uh, he was director of the censorship office. And uh, headed by Bida, the Office for Religious Affairs, was formally subordinate to the prime minister, um, uh, but in fact to the Politburo. It was in fact an executive organ of the party uh, leadership. Uh, hmm. And conclusion, conclusion. <laughs> uh, the, main, the main decision uh, makers in the fight against the church uh, in Poland were very influential people belonging to a narrow, narrow circle of the party leadership, Berman, Mazur, and the gray eminence, Julia Bristiger. Uh, the others, representative of the state administration, were also old distinguished communists. Only one Karol Wienczkowski was younger and less experienced, but he came from the Soviet security services. Uh, Berman and uh, Bristiger had a solid education and Mazur and uh, Bida were also lawyers. Uh, the poorly educated Wolski, on the other hand, was an agent of the Soviet services. So, uh, I think uh, that the decisive factor was trust on the part of Moscow. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We will begin our discussion. Uh, we've got a microphone who will be given to, to our viewers for, for questions. Uh, first question I will uh, sent to both our uh, guests from uh, Croatia and uh, Serbia. Uh, because uh, after the World War II, the head of uh, Polish church, uh, uh, for example, Cardinal Hlond, uh, uh, Cardinal uh, Sapieha, they are old and ill. And they, they died a uh, few years after the war. Uh, we can say God uh, give uh, Polish nations uh, two, maybe three strong men to, to be the head of the church, Cardinal Wojtyła, Cardinal Wyszyński, uh, easy priest uh, Franciszek Blachnicki. Was the same in, in Yugoslavia uh, after the, the, the World War II? Uh, the, the, the head of the church was strong. Uh, who was it? Can I? Okay. So I will speak about Croatia. I think Alexander would say something about Serbia. Well, in, in Croatian Catholic Church, uh, Archbishop Stepinac was a key figure. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was a he was a strong in his uh, beliefs, and he was uh, strongly anti-communist <laughs> from the beginning, in the in the in the twenties and in the thirties, also. And um, he decided to, to be faithful to the Holy See. That was uh, that was maybe his uh, final um, uh, the, the final reason why why Tito and his regime uh, got him in uh, trial. So because they, he was offered to uh, to uh, separate the Croatian uh, Catholic to, to separate Catholic Church in Croatia from the Holy See, mm -hmm. and if he did that, he would be a man of the regime and he will be alive and I don't know what else, but uh, he was, um, he decided to s stay uh, faithful and he, in Croatian people, he, 
he was uh, some kind of a martyr after, uh, especially after he died in uh, in 1960. So, in a way, uh, even today, he uh, he has a strong, strong uh, influence in Croatian uh, Catholic believers. So. Okay. Uh, thank you. And situation, uh, especially in. Uh, Serbia with Serbian Orthodox Church uh, was the same mm -hmm. uh, because the uh, leadership of Serbian Orthodox uh, Church uh, uh, was in a uh, big problem um, at the end of the Second World War because the patriarch wasn't in the country. He was uh, old and mm -hmm. ill. Uh, a group of influenced uh, bishops uh, uh, had anti-communist attitudes. Um, some of them uh, were arrested. Uh, one group uh, was died uh, were died during the Second World uh, War. Uh, a few of them were shot by partisans on the end of uh, war. And um, communist authorities tried to. Uh, establish a new leadership uh, on the second phase uh, from uh, 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 young bishops who were cooperative with authorities. Mm -hmm. um, on uh, one uh, moment, uh, during one speak with Serbian Patriarch Gavrilo, uh, Josip Broz said to him, we don't have a problem with the uh, Serbian Orthodox Church now. Uh, your leadership is in country. And you are, uh, he said, patriotic uh, church. But we have a problem with the Catholic Church because the leadership of a Catholic Church is not in country. It is in, uh, in uh, Vatican. And uh, we must try to divide uh, Catholic Church in uh, Croatia uh, to establish uh, independent uh, Catholic Church in Croatia and Patrick Gavrilo said to him that he will support that attitude if it, it, if it is a possible. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, any questions from viewers? Please give the question to the Good microphone. Good morning. Kristina mm -hmm. Borinskaita from uh, Vilnius. I have two questions for all of you. Uh, first of all, uh, do you know how many priests uh, or bishops were killed uh, or put into prison during the period you research? And the second question, uh, you're speaking about a resistant priest. What about collaborate who priests, bishops who collaborated with the secret services. Do you have uh, uh, such uh, information? Because it's very hard, even in Lithuania, to get such uh, information, because we don't have all the, maybe your country is different situation. Maybe you have such information. Thank you. Firstly, statistical question. Okay. <laughs> I can say about the situation in Croatia. Well, um, uh, Catholic priests in Croatia, there there is a uh, exact number of those who were killed. Three three hundred and eighty, actually. Uh, um, uh, even some estimates are that there are even four hundred uh, priests, monks, and nuns who were killed by the uh, partisan movement and the uh, communist um, uh, communist uh, party from the beginning of the war until the uh, 1947 so that's the exact number on the other hand you you said about the uh, collaborators with the state security service well uh, it's it was a it was a large uh, number of those but we we don't have exact numbers yet because uh, there are researches still ongoing on this topic but uh, the the State Security Service in, in Yugoslavia, not only in Croatia, but in whole Yugoslavia, oh, hard, uh, tried very, very hard to infiltrate those circles because they saw church, especially Catholic church, as one of the um, 
most uh, oppositional uh, institutions in the in the whole Yugoslavia. Actually, the the only uh, one uh, institution which should be uh, cracked in, in 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 that way. So they really tried and they succeeded in many many cases, of course. But uh, in general. Uh, the uh, leadership of the Catholic Church in Croatia fought back, and they they would not they were not uh, uh, they they were not crashed by this uh, state security uh, actions. Okay, thank you for your uh, question. Uh, now we don't have exactly information uh, about that. Uh, we now operated with the uh, number of uh, around 430 uh, Orthodox uh, uh, priests uh, who shot by, uh, by uh, partisans, uh, Germans, uh, uh, Ustasha regimes, and, and uh, uh, collaborating uh, government uh, uh, in uh, Serbia between 1941 and beginning of the 50s. Thank you for this question. I think that is very interesting to compare this, uh, um, these uh, numbers of the priests who were died or uh, who collaborate with the communist system. I think that it should be one of our uh, research uh, direction to do it in the, all of the Central uh, Europe. In Poland, it was uh, that, that uh, near to 2,000 uh, priests were arrested by the communist government until to the 1956. Uh, of course, after this uh, date, after 1956, there was a few uh, uh, priests who were arrested, but the scale was rather minimal because the communists used another um, methods to fight with the clergy. And, um, and your, um, uh, we don't have exact number of uh, priests who were died in the um, in the arrest, but it's probably near to 200. So it's uh, one of the uh, one from the ten of uh, priests who were arrested, uh, died in the uh, prison. Many of them lost their health, uh, have a very uh, long um, health problem. One of the examples of this uh, priest is, was a uh, bishop Antoni Baraniak, who were tortured in the uh, Rakowiecka um, uh, prison, wh which is near to this uh, place we are uh, here, and uh, he was uh, he had. Uh, went uh, 256 uh, uh, meetings with uh, officers of the prison. So in the scale, it was uh, very great because he, um, um, the purpose of this arrest is to uh, use uh, Bishop Baraniak against Primate Stefan Wyszyński. About secret collaborators, we can uh, say that it's of course depend on which period uh, of you are asking about, because in this first decade it was like 10% uh, uh, of the clergy in Poland was a secret collaborators. This number uh, were uh, decreased after 1956, and um, um, in the decade of 80s it was uh, uh, the number of the 10% is um, exact uh, number which we can use because we have a research about uh, this problem. Of course, the um, uh, scale of the collaboration of this piece were uh, different because we have a priest who were um, giving information to the uh, political police after torture, after very uh, strong, uh, very strong uh, surveillance. And we have, uh, uh, we had uh, uh, some example of the priest who very like to be a secret collaborator, getting money, um, because it's, there is some priests who want to be a bishops and they don't make a, made a career in the church as they want, so they have to. They want to. Um, uh, they want to use their knowledge about the church to um, uh, to 
a revenge on the hierarchy that they don't get a, a career in the a Catholic Church. So um, uh, we are discussing now in Poland many cases like that. Um, in some um, situation, I remember one of the priests who uh, produced uh, 30 volumes of the um, of the information and one of the volume it was a uh, 500 pages of uh, information about their colleagues about priests thank you very much uh, next question hello everyone I am uh, Danka Florentina from uh, Romania. I have the same uh, question for all speakers. Um, how were uh, the churches able to function under uh, communist uh, regimes in your countries? Uh, I mean, in Romania, each uh, church must uh, elaborate uh, a statute of uh, organization and operation who must be approved by uh, Romanian parliament. And uh, the second uh, question, did uh, the state uh, pay for the priest's salary uh, wages? And if so, how you explain that? Okay, for uh, for the situation in Croatia, uh, that was a the aim of the regime to to be patronate of the priests. So that is why they established the priest associations. But uh, in the priests who were uh, part of those associations were paid by the by the government by the state. But in Croatia, it failed. It uh, because the Croatian bishops uh, strictly forbidden to. For, for, for priests to take part in that kind of association. So in Croatia, it, it actually failed, although in some other uh, republics of Yugoslavia, for instance, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there was an uh, association which, uh, which had many, many priests in it like, like, as members, and they were paid by the, by the state. So uh, the first question, I'm not sure, uh, it was about uh, how did the, the uh, church uh, resist to the regime? No, what, what was, sorry. How the, the, uh, the church uh, were able to function legally? Mm -hmm. It was a law, it was something. Yeah, but legally, the uh, uh, constitution of Yugoslavia was propagating a freedom of religion. So religious uh, uh, groups could be, uh, be in Yugoslavia, they, they could uh, exist, but uh, they did everything to stop their influence on the people. So uh, nominally, uh, I mean, uh, at, in the constitution it was said that the religion is free. So it's, it, it, was, it was free, but in, uh, in everyday uh, practice it was very hard to be a believer in that period. Um, okay, the situation in, in uh, Serbia uh, was the same because it was uh, one country that period. Uh, uh, but uh, in that circumstances, uh, uh, situation in Serbian Orthodox uh, Church uh, was uh, very hard because uh, uh, the authorities uh, forced to establishing uh, uh, associations of uh, uh, Orthodox uh, 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 priests. Uh, uh, the influence, the roles in uh, that association were by. Uh, a priest uh, who were in partisan movement during the uh, the war. Some of them uh, had uh, uh, functions in that uh, systems. One, uh, two of them were ministers in uh, uh, federal and in uh, republic uh, uh, government. And uh, the aim of that association were to uh, divide. Uh, um, the priests in uh, in in a church and establishing uh, one of uh, one big and influenced group of uh, priests uh, who are very close to the to the state and the party uh, authorities uh, on a formal level. Uh, church uh, was. Uh, 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 legal, but um, 
they have uh, uh, many uh, methods of authorities uh, to, uh, to f I can uh, say, fight fight and oppress on the church and church influence in, in uh, Serbian society. But results uh, uh, wasn't uh, very good for authorities uh, because in uh, traditionally central part of Serbia, influence of church was very strong. Thank you very much. Next questions and next answers in the coffee break. Um, I just want to answer to your question, to, the, the, to these two questions. At first, we can always, uh, underline that uh, um, in the theoretical uh, way, the church in Poland was legal, of course, because it was a church freedom in the constitution of the 1952. Uh, but uh, it was not uh, in a practice in a normal day because the church was under surveillance. They don't have any um, uh, possibility to, uh, to have some association, especially association which was connected with the uh, young generation, because Polish church have a very strong association which are um, uh, going to um, uh, influence on the uh, younger, uh, young generation for the students and so on. And in 1949, it was an act of the uh, parliament who uh, who um, uh, uh, provide that uh, church uh, association is forbidden. And um, your second question um, uh, is about uh, pension of the um, uh, priest. There was a group of priests who were officially collaborate with the system. It calls uh, patriotic priests. So it's uh, very uh, amused for this, uh, uh, for the point of view uh, today. And they get a uh, money for be this collaborator. Of, of, also, they get um, uh, uh, secure that they will be paid after uh, when they finish their uh, work for the church, uh, when they go to retirement. And it was a very crucial for some uh, older priests in uh, Poland. I want uh, to uh, give some uh, small addition to the Miroslav uh, paper that not only the uh, party uh, leaders who are uh, who are responsible for the policy uh, for the church uh, was influential. Also, the um, uh, people who were um, uh, working the uh, secret political uh, police, uh, because um, if they giving a success in the surveillance and uh, investigation um, about church and other denomination, they get uh, promoted in the secret political police. Some of these person were the ministry of the um, internal affairs. So this career was uh, very uh, important and the experience in the fighting with the church was one of the reasons where uh, people from the secret political police made uh, big careers in the, um, in the communist state. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we, we have a coffee break. Uh, one remind, uh, on the table in the hall, there's a material conference, you can take it. Uh, professors, it was a pleasure for me. Thank you very much. <laughs>